anywhere left of this podium, I won't be in frame. So not that I don't love you guys, but right now you don't exist because it's here that side of the podium. So I'm going to try and stay in that side, and hopefully you can hear me. Um, so um, thank you, Chicago Hadoop User Group, for inviting me here. My name is uh, Abhishek Sinha, I'm a senior product manager uh, on the Amazon EMR team. Uh, I'm uh, based on Seattle, been at uh, AWS for about three and a half years. So as a product manager, what I do is when engineers build real code, I do hand baby PowerPoint presentations around them. So uh, uh, it's an interesting role at AWS. Uh, um, the service, uh, how many of you have heard of Amazon EMR? OK, for those of you who haven't heard of Amazon EMR, first of you, for those of you who have heard of EMR, thank you very much. Uh, for those of you who haven't, um, Amazon EMR is a hosted framework for running Hadoop, Spark, and uh, Presto and other data uh, intensive frameworks on top of AWS. Uh, we've been in production for roughly around six years. It's, it's one of the earlier services that we released. Um, and if you look at the name that we have, which is um, EMR, stands for Elastic MapReduce. So though the service uh, runs everything from Presto and Spark and Drill, um, HBase, Hive, and Pig on top of Hadoop. The name is essentially a hat tip to where it all started uh, with the uh, map reduce. So about six or seven years ago, we released the service. Um, essentially, what I'm going to do is I I'd love for you to uh, ask me questions. Um, just just kind of and ask questions while I'm talking. Um, uh, tell me if you know something, some of this, and I'll just go uh, quickly. I have a lot of content, but uh, I want to make sure that you get out of this what you really intended to. Uh, that's my email ID. If you'd like to send me an email about something, if you, have, uh, uh, if you want to give me feedback, that's my Twitter handle as well. If you want to tweet at me, uh, feel free to do so. Um, but essentially, this, what I wanted to qualify what this presentation is and what it is not. So it's, not, it's a deep dive. I know something about the service. I've been with the service for a while. So I'm going to talk about why we built this service. There were certain design principles around um, how to run Hadoop on the cloud. When we started, nobody wanted to think about, uh, or it was, it was almost uh, an anti-pattern to run Hadoop on the cloud. Uh, it's no longer an anti-pattern to run Hadoop on the cloud, or Spark on the cloud. It's probably one of the things that people think about First, um, but that's, uh, uh, that's that's quite a shift from where we started. So, but some of the design principles that we started with uh, are essentially the same, and I would like to talk to you about what our thinking was when we designed the service. Um, how uh, I'll take you through some features of the service, hopefully not bore you with things that are marketing related. But essentially, when you go out of the room and if you wanted to build something on top of EMR, you would have maybe the basics around how to start, where to start, what the features it offers, and what to look for. Uh, what this talk is not about is, I won't talk about, uh, I won't deep dive into Spark, I won't deep dive into Hive, I won't deep dive into Parquet, or why Parquet is better than ORC, or the other way around. I won't talk about that. But I'm happy to answer questions, or if you had, if you had comments about why, uh, about some technology, I'm happy to get us. So uh, EMR is essentially a hosted framework uh, that allows you to run Hadoop, Spark, and other frameworks in AWS. How many of you use AWS, or at least have an EC2 instance on AWS? Yep. A big part of it. Um, so uh, we run, uh, when we, uh, EMR actually runs uh, Hadoop, or Spark, or Presto, or any of these frameworks on top of EC2 instances. So if you're not familiar with EC2, they're basically virtual machines on top of Amazon. There are other services as well, for example, Amazon S3, which is a, 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 a data store. <coughs> I'll talk about some of, uh, some of these. But essentially, if you, if you just want to sleep through my talk, and that's fine. But if there's something that you want to take away from this talk, this would be probably this slide. And I tend to put all of these up front. Now, the first thing. That we, uh, that we thought about when we designed the service was 
clearly very, very different from what Hadoop was built on. So Hadoop was built on bringing compute to storage. However, when we thought about building EMR as a service, we wanted to separate compute and storage. The reason is, when you think about the Hadoop infrastructure, your data and your compute do not grow at the same rate, right? For example, um, you might be processing your data, might, you might have 100 terabytes of data stored uh, uh, in your Hadoop cluster, but on an every hour basis, you might just be processing a terabyte of fresh data, a terabyte of historical data, right? But in an on-premise environment, what happens, or with current notion of Hadoop, the compute and the storage are tightly coupled together. So as you grow your storage, you also grow your compute, which is not necessarily a, a, a great thing, right? So when we, when we thought about this, we didn't want it to be that way. We wanted it to be a, a, a fundamental construct that you can scale up compute as you need to process the data that you need, but compute and storage needs to be separate. And there are many, many, many different reasons for it. So to, to work uh, with that theory, uh, the first thing that we built was we built uh, a connector from Hadoop to S3. So for those of you who don't, don't know, S3 is a stack for simple storage service. It's essentially um, a petabytes of data um, um, that you can put on top of a distributed storage environment. So it's distributed by default. That means whether you put a gigabyte of storage or a petabyte of storage uh, on S3, it's distributed and replicated across multiple availability zones. And you get 11 nines of durability uh, on top of Amazon S3 at something on the periphery of three and a half cents a gigabyte a month. So at that cost, somehow the whole problem of storing big data is no longer, uh, in my opinion, a problem, right? You essentially can store petabyte of data at $1,000 or somewhere around $1,000 a month. So S3 was an extremely, extremely uh, lucrative choice when we wanted to uh, combine Hadoop with S3. So we built a connector. What the connector does, and today the connector is called EMRFS, it makes S3 look like HDFS. So just as you process data out of HDFS, um, HDFS, colon, back, back, something, you reference a file, you, you do exactly the same thing on S3. So when we built Hadoop, we wanted uh, Hadoop to be Hadoop and today Spark and Presto, and today it's a pretty common thing to do that, right? So today, if you think about Presto, which was uh, released by Facebook, uh, has an S3 connector. So for those of you who don't know who is Presto, is, Presto is another distributed SQL query engine. Um, it was released, uh, it came out of uh, Facebook, it's an SIC compliant, and has a native S3 connector. Spark has a native S3 connector. Uh, most of the, the data processing engines that you see have a native S3 connector. So, um, that was, uh, that was one of the things that we thought about the reliability and the durability of S3. So if I have to put one terabyte of data in HDFS, uh, I would need to replicate it three times. Um, so that's, that's essentially three terabytes of data, but um, also that means a lot of moving disks. But even with that, I still have a, a single data center where all my data is residing. With S3, and I'm paying for all those replicated copies of the data that is there. With S3 and at scale, you're, you're just paying for what you store. So if you store one terabyte, it's replicated across multiple different centers, but you're just paying for that one terabyte, right? Also, when you put your data in S3, you don't have to make a compute requirement associated with it. So when I put 10 terabytes of data in S3, I don't have to say that I need 1,000 machines, equal 1,000 equal machines. I can have one machine processing the data or 1,000 machines processing. Because the beauty of cloud is that uh, one machine running for one, uh, uh, sorry, 100 machines running for one hour is same as uh, one machine running for uh, 100 hours, right? The cost is exactly the same. So reliability, durability, and cost were three big factors what uh, made S3 integration with Hadoop or now with Spark and Presto uh, a really interesting uh, proposition for us. Also, uh, people who started running Hadoop on top of AWS, they first put their data on S3, and they did not have to run equivalent amount of compute. 
So as the data grew, the compute did not need to grow. So the total cost of ownership came drastically down. For example, we have a lot of customers whose data is growing at a terabyte uh, an hour, but their compute is not growing a terabyte an hour. They probably need four to five nodes per hour to run that processing, and that's all that they run. They run a four node or five node cluster, but the, uh, but the, uh, the data keeps on growing. This is another advantage of being able to decouple storage and compute. Customers like uh, Netflix and NASDAQ, all of the, everybody who's actually using uh, EMR on the cloud kind of use this design pattern today. The other unintended or uh, consequence of this was that you can have logical separation of jobs. When my data is actually residing in S3, I can run multiple different clusters on top of it, all accessing the same data source. For example, um, I can have a cluster that processes data out of uh, uh, an S3 bucket. So in S3, you call uh, the place where you store data is called a bucket. Yeah. So I can have one cluster that's running high, and it can have access to the same data store. I can have another parallel cluster that is running Presto, and that can have access to the same bucket. Or I can have a dev cluster and a production cluster, all having access to the same bucket. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Yes. So, how does it work when you store the data in the buckets and you run a good job against it? Won't the host, the machine hosting the buckets, have to have support for MapReduce tasks? No. So your MapReduce. So it's a great question. So the question is, how does it, how does it work when you, uh, when, when the data is stored in a bucket? And when you run compute jobs on top of your bu uh, bucket, doesn't the bucket have to have MapReduce jobs? Essentially, no, it's, it's, it's not the same thing. Bucket doesn't need to have. The bucket is just a place where you store data. So instead of thinking of it, think of it as a massively parallel scalable disk, right, that is associated with your compute. Your compute essentially runs from uh, on your, uh, your MapReduce or runs on your compute nodes. It runs on your EC2 machines. Instead of going to the local disk and processing data, the compute goes directly to S3. And S3 is a web service, so it is phenomenally scalable. It creates multiple copies of the data. It also spreads your data across multiple different uh, machines. So every thread that is going to a block is actually might be going to a completely different machine. So, so the question, uh, I guess what you're saying is the compute nodes will mount these S3 buckets and use it as... You don't need to mount it. You don't need to just reference it. Yeah. Okay, yes. So what happens is when you run EMR, there's a component inside EMR called EMRFS. Uh, what it does is it abstracts S3 as an HDFS file system or an HDFS compliant file system. So like how you would reference your HDFS files, uh, HDFS colon something something, that's exactly the same way you will, run, uh, you will reference your S3 file. So you would just say S3, black uh, black, and the name of the key or name of the input data source that is there. Um, so I was talking about being able to run multiple parallel clusters. Our customers really like the idea because when they run clusters on premise, there's this one single monolithic cluster that has all the data and that has all the compute, and everybody is lining up to get resources on that particular cluster, right? Uh, and then you have to do scheduling policies, you have to build uh, interesting ways in which uh, somebody's quota is not getting into somebody's quota. But on the cloud, machines are uh, commodities, or machines are compute is commodity that you can start, and you can run your job, and then you can throw them away when you don't need them, right? So instead of having one single cluster running, what people do, different teams do is, they share the same data that is on S3, all of them have access to the same data set, but they run completely independent Hadoop clusters, right? Accessing the same data set. And when their jobs are done, they just switch off the cluster. They don't even worry about it, right? So that gives us a really nice logical um, uh, isolation between jobs. Question? Yeah. So there's going to be multiple name nodes for each of these yeah, each of them is for all practical purposes of Hadoop. Do so they need to coordinate on what files are where and how if somebody, somebody deletes some file, you know, get Think of it as, these are independent jobs that are running on each cluster, right? So the coordination, if you're chaining your jobs, then you you might want to chain those on the same cluster. But if, for example, I'm running a MapReduce job and you're running a Spark job, 
We don't need to share. The, the only thing we need to share is the data, that the source data that we have. You running it on Spark Machine Learning, I'm doing Hive on top of it. I can run on one cluster, and I don't know anything about what you're running. I'm a logically separate entity, and you can run on another cluster. If one cluster deletes one file, how will it notify the other cluster? So great. So, but then you, uh, that's a great question. So one cluster deletes one file, how will the other cluster get to know about it? That's when you think about, when you think about big data on the cloud, think about data as immutable, right? So you keep your source bucket in the same way. Uh, what people tend to do is that source bucket, where the source data is, is actually immutable. People don't have write permissions onto the bucket. So I can have, I will pull data from that bucket for read-only purposes or for purposes of processing, but I will have my individual output bucket where I'll put my output. You will have your own individual output bucket where you put my output. Now there is a logical separation between these jobs as well and the data as well. Also, it makes sure that if I wrote bad code, it's not going to corrupt you, right? Or if I wrote something bad that completely choked up the cluster, it's not going to corrupt you. So um, the second thing that we built was because everything on the cloud is a fungible resource. That means you can bring up the resource, you can get your work done, and then you can shut off the resource. Resource. We wanted uh, the service of building a new cluster to be a program, uh, programmable entity. So today, using an API or using a CLI, or using multiple different ways, you can spin up a cluster. Let's say a hundred node cluster. It can process the job. Uh, sit, uh, it can process data coming out of S3. And once the job is done, the cluster can automatically shut itself down. So instead of the, this idea of having one big cluster. Which is, which is fine if you want to have that idea. But instead of having this idea of one big cluster that does everything, people have started looking at the clusters that can run their specific jobs on the data on S3. There are many people that have done this where they've gone out of an on-premise cluster and moved to multiple different clusters on Amazon S3 and still save costs. And I'll talk to you a little bit about that. But that was another design principle that we wanted to be. A, we wanted all of this to be programmable, API driven, so that you could easily build code around it. And once you're starting to build code around it, then uh, launching a cluster, setting up a cluster is essentially a click of a button. So I'll, I'll talk about. So once you see some of the slides that are here about how we provision clusters, how are things done, uh, you'll get a much better idea of what. Uh, what I'm talking about. But essentially, the things that I want you to take back is the design principles about, around building a cloud is separation of compute and storage, being able to some, uh, 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 separate compute and storage, uh, being able to pro uh, programmatically spin up and spin down clusters on the fly, and being able to logically separate all those entities, but still get the advantage of a do that you write. So how do you provision clusters? I mean, there's, a, there's like everything in AWS, there's a console, there's an API, there's a CLI. For example, what you see on, on my right-hand side is a simple cluster. It says, uh, what do I need? I, I, what's the name of my cluster? Uh, what do I want on this cluster? I want Hive, Hadoop, Spark, Presto. How many nodes do I want? And where is it going to process data from? And then it has some certain variables around where do I want to launch it, which particular region. Um, there's some security related. Uh, what's my uh, SS, uh, SSH keys for this cluster? And off you go. Generally, it will take you about four to seven minutes to launch a complete cluster. And what that's doing is it's bringing up instances. It's loading up operating system on top of it. It's building Hadoop on top of it. It's building a complete cluster uh, given your specifications. And it's giving you a cluster. It's also setting up things like security groups or firewalls around individual groups. It's also uh, building all the libraries and everything. So within a matter of four to seven minutes, you all you have a Hadoop cluster provision and ready to process data. You can also program it where you say, spin up my cluster, process the, do uh, run these jobs. Let's say these are three chain jobs that I want to run. From this uh, source of data, put the output somewhere else. And when you're done, just shut yourself down. Right? And that saves a lot of cost for, uh, for, for people. Now, you can also schedule this. So, yeah, question? Yeah, I think there's actually a measure for the 
Yeah, so uh, Boris's question is, is great. There are conditions where uh, you can take longer. Uh, there are reasons to be that we might be having a short-term capacity problem. We might be having a problem with that particular instance in that particular availability zone. Uh, it might be a problem with spot, for example. If you there's a concept on AWS where you can bid for uh, unused capacity that's called spot instances, and sometimes they get uh, that go at an 80 to 90 percent discount of the on-demand price. Um, if your price doesn't match the capacity, you can take sometimes longer to provision those instances. But those are three or four reasons, or a bug, that will help, that will cause you to pro take a longer time to provision. Uh, I mean, realistically, Dan was like the greatest I ever in was there. So you would see much better. Uh, one of the reasons you see 10 is uh, we used to have uh, the machine images that sit on top of uh, uh, EC2 instances for Hadoop used to come out of S3. Uh, very soon you will see much more uh, faster way in which we'll do it. We'll basically use EBS back dummies. Uh, by using EBS back dummies, the, the startup time will go uh, even better. Uh, on long clusters or on big clusters, uh, like 100, couple, 100 odd nodes, you might see 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, but the TP50 time generally is about four to seven minutes across a range of long running clusters. Boris seems to disagree because he sees 15 minutes. So let's keep it 15 minutes. Yeah. I, I wish a similar experience what you said because well, what I'm doing is one master, two nodes. It takes at least one and a half hours time. Okay. And, uh, and what, what, so. Uh, what instances are you launching this on? What availability zone? Are you doing some spot? Uh, I think we are using US Virginia that region. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't know the details, but I can compare it. So what happens is, uh, if you look at sometimes when, when things take 30 minutes to launch, what happens is, uh, on spot, so uh, if you know about spot instances, so Amazon tells you, hey, here's excess capacity on these instances, and if you bid, uh, and there's a market price for those instances, and if you can't bid uh, lower, uh, high, sorry, if you bid higher than the market price, you get those instances, right? So for example, uh, let's say the on-demand price for an M1 extra large instance, some instance is $1, and, but the market price in spot is 10 cents. Uh, if I bid something like 15 cents, and the market price is 10 cents, I will get the instance at 10 cents. Right, so it's, it generally follows a market trend. People bid on capacity. Sometimes if you bid on capacity on spot, what happens is um, the price is either not, not right or the price has gone up. So we will keep trying. Because what also happens is the price spikes up in smaller spikes. Right, the price goes up and down. So what EMR does is it keeps trying till it gets you a cluster. Yeah, so um, there are cases where it'll take 10 to 15 minutes also, as you write it, as you point out. Uh, those cases will be outliers. Uh, if you tell me, uh, the best way to tell me that is to give me, there's a, there's a job flow ID or there's a cluster ID that starts with a J. Uh, if you give me that, we can investigate. We can actually get to the bottom of it. It's a pretty solvable problem. It could also be things like it's missing a validation chain. For example, um, there isn't uh, enough IPs in that subnet. And sometimes that takes time for the error to bubble up. Right? So um, from EC2 itself. There could be multiple different scenarios why, why it does that. Um, OK, so coming back. Uh, so on the right hand side, you will see that uh, it's a simple uh, CLI. You say AWS. Uh, if you use the AWS CLI, AWS EMR create cluster, you give it a bunch of parameters, and off it goes, it creates a cluster for you. Uh, there are different types of, uh, it allow, uh, so EMR allows you to use different types of uh, uh, machines on Amazon. So Amazon has a wide range of machines. They have these acronyms that start with like M general, uh, M1 dot something or M3 dot something. They all stand for a certain characteristic of the machine. 
So the M1 is a general purpose uh, machine. So it has a, a equal distribution of memory versus compute versus disk. People generally use it for batch processing. So Hive and PIC are great use cases for that. Um, then there are uh, other machines where, for example, the C-class machines or the CPU-intensive machines. Essentially what it means is, is the per dollar CPU that you're getting out of this machine is cheapest on this machine. So the CPU-intensive machine has the cheapest CPU. The memory-intensive machine has the cheapest memory. And the disk-intensive machine has the cheapest disk. So that's how they are categorized. They're older generation, the new generation. Uh, EMR allows you to specify a different type of instance uh, per cluster. Because your jobs are all, not all the same, so and, and multiple people today have a collection of Hive and Pig and, and Spark running on top of their uh, 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 data. Uh, they can, you can mix and match different instances, or you can have clusters depending upon the workload that you have, right? So if you're running Spark, you can use memory intensive in uh, instances. If you're running Hive or, or Pig, you can use batch processing instances. Instances. If you're high compute intensive, then you can use uh, compute intensive instances like instances like C3s, etc. Um, there, there's a concept. So EMR uh, creates nodes, three kinds of nodes. There's something called as a master node. There's something called as a core node, and there's something called as a task node. Right. So in Hadoop, there's a concept of master and slave. But essentially, the master node is your uh, is your master node. It's where the name node service in Hadoop one. Is run. It's all the. Is the. It's where all the other Hadoop two services also run. The core node. The difference between core node and task node, which are both slave nodes, is core nodes run the data node service, or they have HDFS. The task nodes don't have uh, the data node service. That means they don't have HDFS. Uh, why is that? Why is that distinction important? A lot of people, when they are processing data directly out of S3, do not need HDFS at all. And the benefit of not having HDFS is when one machine goes off, you can start another machine and your processing can keep on happening. right? Or you can scale up the number of machines and scale down the number of machines and your processing can keep on happening. However, on HDFS, it's not the same thing. HDFS has three times replication. There's data sitting on it. So when a machine dies, uh, there is some implications of the machine uh, going off. That means there's going to be some amount of re um, uh, uh, renegotiation within HDFS, there's going to be some data that's going to be moved and stuff like that. So that's why we clearly make the distinction of uh, HDFS and non-HDFS nodes. If you're running all out of S3, for example, if you're running Spark, and you're running uh, um, a batch processing job on Spark, uh, if, and if your HDFS utilization is really low, then you can run all of those on task instances. The beauty of task instances is that they just compute capacity, and you can scale them up and scale them down as and when you need it. Right. So, yeah. Can you give some examples of cases where you will need lots of old machines and examples where you need lots of task machines? Sure. If you, for example, uh, if your data, uh, if you create lot, lots and lots of intermediate files, right? That's when you will need HDFS machines. Uh, so. Uh, Depends upon how you've written your uh, your program. So uh, newer data processing frameworks, which tend to do a lot on memory, don't need a lot of HDFS. So Presto and Spark tend to not use a lot of HDFS. They tend to do they, they do spill the disk, but they tend to use a lot more memory than disk. But if you're doing a lot on lot more in Pig and you're generating a lot of intermediate files, you would want to have more number of cores. So the way to do it, how do you know how many core and how many tasks do I need? Just run a cluster, run your job, and we give you HDFS utilization on, as a metric on your console. So if your HDFS utilization is 5% and you're running like uh, uh, 10 core nodes, you know you can flip the ratio, right? You can go down. You don't need to run that much HDFS and you can run more tasks, right? If you're running uh, HBase, for example, that will run on HDFS. If you're running Impala today, which doesn't work with S3, then you will run on HDFS. That's when you need core nodes. The task nodes will, the task nodes are just compute capacity. They will not help in that case. Uh, yeah. So in case of task nodes, where will the eventual still be in case of Spark? There's, there's still local disk on task nodes. So um, uh, the spill will be a local. But if it's HDFS. Can you the question? Oh, yeah. So the question is, uh, what happens when there's spill on the task nodes? 
right? So if you don't have uh, HDFS uh, on the task nodes and you still spill to disk, what happens? When you don't need to share the data, so it's not an output of a shuffle or something like that, then it's okay. If it's an output of a shuffle, then they, it'll go to S3. It'll try to put the data in S3. Uh, the other node might want to take, pull the data out from S3, but it, it'll not be the most desirable condition that you want. We give you a monitoring framework. So uh, for example, if you have, uh, um, if you've heard of CloudWatch, uh, we give you about 23 different Hadoop-related metrics that are integrated with EMR. One of them is the HDFS utilization. Uh, you can look at this. This is, this is free with the, with the service. So when you're running a cluster, you can go to the console and you can look at all of this utilization, uh, all different metrics. There's also, if you wanted uh, granular metrics, you can, uh, EMR also allows you to install Ganglia on top of it. So it's just a flag which says install Ganglia. And then you can go into JVM related metrics. You can go into all different sorts of uh, detailed metrics around uh, uh, around Hadoop or the processing framework that you run. Also the native interfaces or the web interfaces that uh, uh, Hadoop and Spark offer, uh, uh, that are, uh, that those are also available on EMR. So there is a lot of different uh, areas or avenues from where you can get monitoring information or performance related information. We also do, uh, we also, uh, there's also a simple button called debug which says enable debugging. And what it does is it basically takes all your steps or all your task attempts uh, and puts them in a nice tabular format uh, into a database that you can go and access uh, from the console. So if I have a job which runs a uh, huge number of mappers, producers, or tasks, or steps, uh, uh, or, uh, or executors, all of them uh, will have an ID. And instead of going and parsing through a log, what you can go and uh, you can go and look at that in an index format uh, in a database that is available from the console, and we don't charge you for it. So uh, let's say I want to, I had a failure. I don't know what to do with it. I, I, I need to go into the specific task that failed. I can go and click, and it'll take you to that particular task and to that particular part of the log that the task uh, refers to. So makes debugging uh, debugging Hadoop is really difficult. Uh, it makes it a little bit easier. I don't think it makes it very easy, but it makes it a little bit easier to find the place where the uh, error originated from. Also, uh, uh, we allow, so uh, when you, uh, pro you're processing data, you're also generating a ton of logs, right? Um, you might want to look through these logs to figure out what happened. You might be looking at doing this for extraction of certain metrics. You might be doing this for figuring out whether uh, a certain job ran well or just for debugging purposes. But today, you might be do uh, doing that in an on-premise cluster where, or on a permanently running cluster, where you are um, you are incurring cost when you're trying to debug. So what we built a feature, what it does is uh, you designate a bucket and it takes the logs, puts all of them together, and puts them in S3. So if you had a failure, you can shut down the cluster, go into the logs, and actually go and debug the logs without actually incurring cost of the cluster still being up. Right. So um, how do people use it? People use it in many different ways. For example, there is a job that is stuck and uh, is not moving. So uh, the logs are in S3 because you have this feature on. You can go and kill the cluster, start a completely new cluster, and now you can, uh, so that people who are trying to run jobs can now go ahead and run their jobs. But now, you can go in peace and look at these logs in S3, and they're not accruing any kind of cost because of EC2. Yeah, question? So the question is, is this something that Splunk does uh, and you're doing it as a part of the EMR service? That's a great question. Uh, no, that's not, uh, they're not equivalent, but you can feed these logs into Splunk. These are just raw logs. What we're doing is we're building a transport mechanism that allows you to take these logs and put them in some location in S3 automatically. These are all your Hadoop logs, these are EMR logs, um, and it just aids the debugging process, being able to go to S3 and look at these logs. Now, if you have a Splunk engine or you go anywhere, if you have any kind of uh, ELK stack that you are using to process these logs, you can, you can feed these logs into that stack as well. 
right? So they work as a complementary system rather than. Great. So it essentially, it's check of button. <coughs> also, this idea of being able to uh, resize clusters, right? So uh, being able to scale up clusters and scale down clusters. A lot of us have analytics jobs where we are processing data on an hourly basis, and at the end of the day, we reconcile all the data or do reprocessing of all the jobs. So for my hourly setup, I might just need four to 10 nodes. But for the uh, end of the day or the end of the month, especially when you're reprocessing a lot of data, <coughs> you might need hundreds of nodes, right? You can scale up the capacity of the cluster for that period of time. And then once the job is over, you can scale down the capacity of the cluster. So that's one of the benefits of the cluster for being able to process data on S3 that you can scale up the cluster any time and scale it down. If you have task nodes, it becomes even more easier to be able to do that because a scaling down event does not have any interruption. So if a scaling down event happens the, and, uh, and you ended up dominating a node that had some uh, job running on it, Hadoop will just read file that job. Yeah? Is this a manual provisioning of more nodes or more dynamic based on the load on the node? So that's a great question. So the question is, is this manual in nature or is this dynamic? So um, it's today is manual uh, using an API. <coughs> that means you can call a resize API. So I can say EMR, uh, a particular job ID, resize, I can get it a target count. And it will go to that count. But on what trigger is not automated? And this is while the job is running? This is while the job is running. This is while the job. You can program it as well. This is while the job is running. What it doesn't do is it doesn't automatically scale up and scale, uh, and scale down based upon the load condition because we don't know what that load condition is. But you can build a system where, uh, remember in, the, in the slide before I showed you CloudWatch metrics. So you can expose a metric and based upon that metric, you can l write something like a lambda function or write a trigger that invokes this API. So when my, for example, when my HDFS utilization goes beyond 90%, add another node. Or when my, age, when my cluster is at 0% utilization, kill it. Or resize it down to two, right? So um, in the previous slide, I showed you that how you expose a metric on the CloudWatch. You can alert on any of these metrics as well. Question? No? OK. So um, essentially, it's, 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 uh, th this slide is, is talking about uh, the, same, the same idea, that you can scale up your clusters and scale down your clusters to meet uh, SLA needs. But when you, start, uh, when you start mixing that with spot, uh, spot instances, then you start seeing the real benefit of it. And I'll, I'll show you an example. So I said spot is essentially unused capacity on Amazon that we allow you to bid for. It sometimes goes at 90 to 80 percent discount, right? So, and you can the price is available. It follows a market pattern. When there is more demand, the price goes up. When there is less demand and high capacity, the price goes down. But you, when you, there is nothing different from an engineering point of view on an instance when the instance is bought. It's just the pricing. So, a one dollar instance could go at 10 cents, right? So, what we've done is we have integrated this with uh, uh, with EMR. We have integrated spot natively with the EMR. So let's take an example. That let's say I have a seven hour job, and I'm going to look back so that I don't give you a different example. Uh, let's say I have a seven hour job uh, that requires 100 nodes, which each node costing me a dollar, right? So in this case, I will spend $700 on this particular cluster to process this job. Right? This is my worst possible SLA. This is when I need to get the data out to whoever needs to consume it. Let's say it's seven hours. So let's say I add in 100 more spot instances to it. Right? Now, so 100 node cluster has moved to a 200 node cluster. Right? Even if I don't assume linearity and say that this time, which was seven hours, get cut to more than half, let's say four hours. Right? Not three and a half hours, four hours. So what am I running? So the initial 100 nodes that I had at $1, I'm running those. Let's say the new 100 nodes that I have, 
at a spot, I got it at 50% discount. Generally, you can get it at 70 to 80% or 90% discount, but let's say 50% discount. If you add that, I have saved about $100, but finished the job in almost half the time. So what customers do is, whatever your worst possible SLA is, they size a cluster always, always according to that, on demand. But then they start argumenting the cluster with spot nodes, and every time you get the spot capacity, you always end up saving cost and always end up running faster. The disadvantage of spot is, if somebody bids higher than you, then I will take away that spot instance from you. I as in AWS will take away that spot instance. So in this case, if let's say all those 100 instances were taken away from me, I would still be running exactly the same scenario which was acceptable to me previously, which was my job was supposed to finish in, uh, in seven hours. So every time you use part, you will save cost and you will save money. So when you buy it on the spot, how long do you have it? So there's no guarantee that you're going to have it for a period of time is what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. So the question is, when you buy an instance on spot, how long do you have it? So when, you, when I say buy, by the way, uh, I mean, oh, thank you. When I, say, uh, when I say you buy, it's all programmatic access to an API. So when you say easy to run instances, you also specify a price along with it. So the question is, when I buy, how long do I have? Till somebody outbids you, or till you give it away? So if I have a spot instance, and spot if within, but you get billed on Amazon at a one hour boundary. If spot takes away the instance, on the 59th minute, spot won't charge you. It's, it's free. If you got your work done, great. But if you give away the instance on the 59th minute, spot will charge you. If spot takes you, it takes away the instance at one hour, five minutes, it will charge you only for an hour, not for the five minutes. So it always charges you for the one hour bucket. So if you look at spot integration today uh, with EMR, it's just like how you build a cluster. So instead of saying EMR create cluster 10 nodes on an M1 large instance, I would say EMR create cluster 10 nodes M1 large, and the price I want to bid is 10 cents. Now here's the beauty. The price that you bid is not the price that you pay. Right? It's the market price, right? So let's say the market price currently is at 10 cents and I bid a one dollar. What would I pay? 10 cents. If the price goes up to 20 cents, I will still have the capacity because I bid one dollar. But what would I pay now? 20 cents. If the price goes up to one dollar ten cents, then only my my capacity will be lost. Because I, thought, I said the maximum I want to pay is one dollar. Right? Yeah, of course. Yeah, uh, mine was great with Hadoop 1. With Hadoop 2, it becomes a little bit more complicated. Because <coughs> the yard is side by itself, where to put the application monitor for this particular task, and it might end up on the spot nodes, uh, spot nodes. Uh, you guys here can obscure command to prevent this, but can you please put it on the main screen? Yeah, so the question is, uh, so, so Boris's comment is that with Hadoop 2, you can have something like a Yarn application manager uh, that goes on a spot instance, and what happens if your whole cluster is alive, but that particular instance which is, uh, runs the Yarn application master uh, is taken away by spot, then my cluster is rendered useless. So we have a command, uh, which allows you to, which says that do not run your application master on spot instance. But Boris, if you use the new AMIs, where by default, unless you specify the entire cluster on spot, which a lot of people do, so for example, their uh, backfill jobs. This is a great example of where people run a uh, massive amount of uh, reprocessing of all of their data, one year worth of data. So backfill jobs, I, want, I don't care if my job fails, but I don't want to pay a higher amount for this. In that case, the entire cluster is running on spot, right? So the Yarn application manager goes on spot. Otherwise, with the later armies, like 3.9 and 3.8 and 3.9, and on the Portex.x armies, we don't put the Yarn application manager as much as possible on a spot instance. If there is an on-demand instance, we will put the application master on the on-demand instance. Right, so basically, we're running 
Yes, on the new AMI, it will automatically be then the YARN application master. You're forcing the YARN application master to be run on the master. Yeah, this is YARN application master. What about the case? Yeah, so uh, we will try as much as possible to keep them on demand. But if you're just running the master uh, and everything else on spot, they might just go uh, spot as well. So the suggestion would be I. They run three nodes of demand, yeah. which should be good enough for most of the applications. Yeah. And the rest can be Exactly. So, and this is the same suggestion uh, when you think about your core nodes and, and task nodes. Right? So let's say if I'm running a 100 node cluster, um, I start with 50 nodes of core and 50 nodes of task. But if my HDFS utilization is really, really low, then you just run 10 nodes on core and run the other 90 on spot. Because the other 90, you will get an 80 to 90% discount. We have customers that run their entire data processing application on spot. And you'd be surprised that, for example, this is a, uh, uh, there is, I feel that as long as your application supports it, for example, things like Spark and uh, Spark running on Yarn or Pesto or application supports it, uh, you should run as much as Spot as possible. Also, so what should I bid on Spot? So we recently released this uh, nice uh, UI where based upon the last, you can see Spot prices, there's an API of Spot prices. You know what the Spot current market price is, you can decide what you want to pay. But we also tell you today that depending upon an availability zone and what instance, what is the chances of you getting interrupted, right? So, and this chart gets updated based upon a 30-day uh, value. And it has got a nice checkbox that says instances supported by EMR as well, right? So, here you would see that this was uh, US West, North Cal uh, California. The bid price, if I set the bid price as 50% on demand, then my chances on all of these instances based upon uh, based upon the frequency of outbidding last month and last week is fairly low. And the savings on demand that I get is about 90%. If you make a commitment to AWS to keep that instance running all the time on reserve, you get about 67 to about 60 odd percent discount. So the discount on Spark is huge. And Hadoop, by its nature of being stateless and by its nature of being self-healing or being able to restart jobs and stuff like that, is really, really a great application for this work, for this uh, setup. Also, by being able to decouple your storage and compute, your storage is now sitting in a persistent layer on S3. It has high durability. But your compute can come and go away. And the storage won't matter. What happens to the storage won't matter. How do I submit jobs to a cluster? There are multiple different ways of submitting jobs to the cluster. You can submit jobs directly to the Hadoop API. There's also an EMR API called the Steps API. But what it does is uh, it enforces seriality of jobs. That means if you have, if you say steps, submit one job, another job, third job, fourth job, uh, it will serialize those jobs. It will, that means it will finish the first job and will run the other job uh, um, uh, after that. If you directly submit it to the Hadoop API, Hadoop will try and run all of those jobs in parallel, right? Uh, you can also use AWS Data Pipeline. So with Data Pipeline, <coughs> Data Pipeline is essentially an orchestration tool that allows you to run jobs, uh, uh, allows you to uh, define a pipeline. So my pipeline could be dump data, uh, bring data in. Once the data is there, start a Hadoop cluster process this data and push this data into some other data source and then shut down the cluster. I want to do this every hour. I can define this in AWS Data Pipeline and Data Pipeline can schedule this job on a hourly basis and give me inputs or give me alerts when the job is not run. So it's essentially a scheduling tool. I can also SSH into the cluster. So with EMR, you, the, though the instances, the instances that are running, the EC2 are running in your account. Though we call it a managed service, 
you have full control. You have root access. You can change anything that you want. You can load up a new jar. You can load up your customizations. You can SSH into the cluster and do anything you like, which is slightly different from other managed services within AWS like Redshift and, and RDS. You can also, so Yelp wrote a nice Python-based library called MRJob. There's also uh, an EMR integration available there. So if, you, if you'd like your uh, uh, Python, then you can use MRJob. Essentially, the way people are orchestrating their jobs are, they would use some kind of a script or some kind of code which will launch the cluster, which will dis uh, also launch the job. And once the job is done, the cluster will automatically be shut down. Now, if you don't want to do that, that's an option as well. There are lots and lots of people uh, who run clusters for a fairly long time. Uh, a present company included is in the, the, the customers that we are in right now. You guys run a lot of jobs for really, really long periods of time as well. So it's, people tend to think that EMR can only be used when you're running jobs and you have to shut down the cluster after the job is finished. That's not the case. If you want to run a cluster, Permanently, that's also fine, right? It just gives you that choice. And it gives you a choice not to choose one versus the other. Run your production cluster as a permanent cluster. Run your ad hoc jobs as whenever you require. And if you have a condition where the data has grown, you can scale up. Also, <coughs> we have native integration in, 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 uh, with Spark. So you can today uh, run Spark 1.4 on EMR. Uh, we released it 10 days after uh, the community release 1.4, so we are fairly current on the version of Spark as well. The Steps API, you can also use the Steps API to submit a Spark job. So the Steps API essentially does a Spark submit step for you, right? So if you want an API way, API programmable way of submitting jobs to a cluster, that can be done as well. Recently, we, uh, yeah. Yeah, so uh, great question. So today, um, um, the question is, um, people do submit jobs out of an edge node. Uh, EMR doesn't have a concept of an edge node. So what do people do? Uh, some people take uh, uh, build an edge node, uh, but there could be complications around how the binaries interact. Uh, so just take an EMR, the EC2 instance, they build the binaries on top of it. Not a really great way of doing this. Most people generally uh, use data pipeline in that case, because they uh, use data pipeline to submit the jobs directly to the cluster. Then you're not managing that edge node uh, at all. Well, if I'm using steps, I don't need the edge node. It's only if you're using, sorry, what? If I'm using steps, steps. I don't need the edge node. No, no. So the only reason why I want to use something like edge node is that I may always starting jobs, or I want to buy steps. Yes, so I mean, if you don't like the uh, API interface, then that's, and you want to submit jobs directly to the Hadoop API, that's or you, you have an edge based client running, that's when you would use uh, something like an edge node. Um, there are open source projects also that are uh, there, for example, Genie by Netflix is essentially does the whole work of an edge node. So you submit jobs to the Genie interface, and Genie at the back end decides which EMR cluster to run it on. And all you get is uh, an endpoint which says my output is going to be at this particular location. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a gap. It's a gap that we don't have an edge node. We can make it simpler for you guys to have but most people just use the steps API in that case. And see now it becomes better previously you get the limitation of yeah. Yeah. So the comment was that uh, uh, we were very painful because uh, EMR imposed in the early days and imposed a limit of 256 steps, that means 256 jobs on a cluster. Um, it was just some arcade reason why it was like that. But uh, that is. 
Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, that reason is no longer true. So uh, the people had to use an edge node. You would use an edge node because that's where you fire off your job. Uh, but yes, uh, today uh, building an edge node on top of EMR is, is slightly different. Uh, unless you use the API uh, or the pipeline, your choice is up to you. Uh, would you guys recommend to use Monster as an edge node or various layers overkill? Uh, uh, no, I don't think it's an overkill. Uh, but we generally, uh, we think data pipeline is, would be our first choice for as an edge node. Sorry, is it? It's like a big machine gun. It's like a big machine gun. Yes, yeah, so it's, uh, it's like a big machine gun. Um, I think we can make it simple. We can make the edge node concept pretty simple. We can possibly, you can, um, I don't have uh, anything on that right now. Uh, but yeah, we've been thinking about this, uh, how to make the edge node much simpler. Maybe we bundle all the jars and all the dependencies on a simple army and just give it to you for you to run. That could be one way of doing it. This becomes especially interesting when people start moving uh, to Spark streaming. Yeah. Where you have to have a page to yep. run. Yep. Um, so we um, uh, recently also um, uh, made a new release on EMR called EMR 4.0. Uh, essentially that has Hadoop 2.6, Hive, uh, uh, not the latest, but 1.0, Spark 1.4. But also what it does is the previous versions of EMR uh, used to have non-standard places where the configuration used to sit. Now we have moved all of our configuration, all of our packaging onto Apache Big Top. So if you guys are familiar with Apache Big Top, it's a packaging project and under the Apache umbrella, we've uh, managed to pull all our packaging into Apache Big Top. Uh, also, it gives you a very simple way of configuring your applications. So we have a config API now that allows you to configure different applications on top of uh, EMR as well. Uh, just want to take a break. Is this is this interesting? Is this uh, getting you guys what you wanted? I can go on. This is all I do. <laughs> so, uh, questions? Yeah. So, are there any performance guidelines with storing files on S3 and accessing them directly from um, the performance guidelines, so, so the question is, are there any performance guidelines of storing files in S3 and accessing them directly on EMR? They're the same as when you store files in S3, right? So when you store files in S3, you want to make sure that your key naming scheme uh, when you store files in S3, the name of a particular object is the key into the hash. You want to make sure that your hash is evenly distributed, right? So that you don't start to have uh, everything just hashing into the same uh, bucket. So you don't start to have hot partitions. We're talking about this at really, really high scale. More, and I think the S3 documentation talks about what is that scale means. It's, uh, um, it's probably more than 150 to 200 transactions per second. It's not simple. Uh, it's not like, oh, well, if I just put three files, we'll start having uh, issues. Uh, the performance, uh, customers do ask us what is the difference between HDFS performance versus S3 performance. I think that was the meat of your question. Well, uh, that's another question. Yeah, so uh, it depends upon the workload. With TPC DS, which is which we think is not a representative workload. Nobody runs TPC DS for the production environments. Uh, uh, the difference, uh, sometimes we, S3 is, is better uh, than HDFS, and sometimes it's very, very close. So it depends upon what, it depends upon a lot more parameters and what instances you, you use, uh, whether you're running a VPC or not VPC because the networking matters. Uh, how many, instead of having uh, 10 nodes uh, 10 really big nodes going into S3, you can also have, uh, for the same cost, 100 smaller nodes going into S3. So you have more panel threads into S3, so that also changes the equation uh, a little bit. But if you look at publicly published information from uh, people such as Netflix and NASDAQ, you will see that the performance, uh, uh, the performance uh, comparison is, is very, very similar. Yeah. Uh, we've been 
putting our nodes inside of VPC and then accessing this through your hole, that there's a performance hit to that. Also, I understand that now you can access S3 directly from the VPC without going back out uh, network-wise. Is there, I mean, does that, does that get rid of any performance yet from accessing S3 inside the VPC? So the question is, uh, if you're accessing data from inside the VPC, uh, uh, there is a there is a performance hit because you're going out in some way. Um, that might be <coughs> true if you're using a NAT instance, but today, if you're running out of if you're running inside a VPC, EMR only excuse me, EMR only runs if you have a public subnet associated with it. That means you have uh, uh, an endpoint to go through a public uh, S3 URL. With EMR, uh, S3 now has a VPC endpoint. So um, the performance benefit that you get inside running inside VPC is because of advanced networking that is only uh, available inside the VPC. I haven't seen data that suggests that uh, having an internet gateway versus not having an internet gateway changes things. When you have a specific Amazon machine image uh, that can take advantage of enhanced networking on EC2 instances, uh, then we see a performance benefit of running in VPC. So that's one thing, and that's only available in VPC. So that's what we have seen, but we have not seen real performance data which says that having a gateway versus not having a gateway uh, has anything to do with performance. It's essentially a routing. So there shouldn't be any performance because the performance because the instance pulls data via private network. Uh, yeah, that's. The instances are connected to the S3 via private network. I'm sure that's a really fantastic. Yeah, um, it depends the, the how fat the uh, the connected the connector is is really dependent upon the instance type. So when you saw a list of all those instances that are there, uh, each one of them have different networking profiles. Uh, a bigger instance has a bigger networking profile. Smaller has a smaller. Um, uh, that was obvious, right? So, uh, uh, but uh, essentially, uh, uh, what is not obvious from the statement is how many nodes were there in the cluster, right? So instead of having uh, two one gig pipes, did I have uh, ten half gig pipes? So what was the aggregate throughput that you got out of the cluster, right? So it's a matter of when you start doing the performance benchmarks. It's just not an instance in S3, it's also the size of the cluster, and what are you running out of S3 that matters. Um, I'll talk about security, uh, so I'll uh, help you sleep, uh, if you're not already so. Uh, <laughs> but essentially, if you, if you, if you, if you, if you know about uh, IAM roles and access controls on, uh, on AWS, uh, EMR allows you to do that as well. EMR is natively supported with the IAM roles, in fact, very, very soon. If you're not on IAM, we will constantly tell you to please get on IAM uh, or on roles because we're migrating all our customers to uh, ro use roles by default. So you might get a message or an email which says, uh, you're, you created a cluster without roles, uh, please migrate to roles because we think it's the most secure way in which you can run uh, on top of these here, on top of AWS. Also, by default, when you start a cluster, we configure some firewall groups, right? So uh, these are called the security groups. Uh, there's a master security group, which uh, uh, is only around the master node. All the saved nodes are put across, uh, are bundled in one slave security group, and the master node can, the only way to reach the slave nodes is through the master node. So by default, there's some uh, security, network security that is built into uh, so firewalls that are built into EMR. You can, uh, of course, uh, for you to be able to connect from outside, you would need to open specific ports. Uh, for you to be able to connect to slave nodes, you need to uh, use specific, open specific ports. Also, um, uh, EMR also supports uh, encryption of data in S3. So this is, this is something that uh, customers uh, uh, like NASDAQ use. So what they use is, uh, you can you can encrypt the data on S3 with keys that are actually outside the uh, the cloud in your own HSM, and EMR can and can 
invoke those keys to process encrypted data directly out of S3. So you can have both S3, server, uh, S3 uh, client side encryption and server side encryption, and EMR will be able to process both of this data. So we have a blog post on our blog. So if you haven't looked at it, um, um, from my team, there's a uh, we run a blog post, or we start a blog post called the AWS Big Data Blog. You can search for it. We post uh, weekly. Uh, we tend uh, uh, we tend to bias towards uh, strong technical articles. Uh, so we had a blog post written by the principal architect at NASDAQ, uh, who who described how they use uh, SafeNet HSM, uh, which sits on their on-premise to encrypt data in S3, and allow EMR to process encrypted data directly from S3. Right, so a lot of for a lot of people from security and compliance perspective, this is of utmost importance. So EMR kind of gives you that uh, that ability as well. Yeah, I I just a slide. Uh, this is their the, the diagram. Essentially, um, uh, EMR being able to process encrypted data with keys sitting in an HSM outside the cluster. I'll not go into the details of this, but you can look at it, look it up in the blog. But essentially, what it does is, I can, uh, you can uh, uh, extend uh, encryption uh, materials provider and add it uh, to your own HSM. You can build a jar around it and tell the EMR that use these jars, right? So that's the way you add your own HSM that is sitting outside the, cl the cloud on your on-premise uh, machines. Uh, and allow it to encrypt data uh, at rest on uh, EMR. There are, uh, obviously, I talked about this uh, uh, this a little bit integration with other AWS services. Um, uh, S3 as your persistent uh, data store uh, and being able to run uh, either long running or short uh, running clusters there. Um, uh, Also, multiple clusters can be run with the same data set. Yeah, question. So for HDFS, like what kind of security do you have to go to Kerberos, or is your security system more compatible? Um, or is it just, is it just S3 that has the Amazon security? Right, so the question is, uh, what happens with HDFS? There's lots of different ways in which you can encrypt HDFS. You can, um, HDFS native encryption with Hadoop 2.6 allows you to do uh, KMS. Uh, there's a Hadoop KMS, so you can encrypt HDFS, and there's encryption zones there that you can uh, that you can use. Uh, today, we don't have uh, native integration with AWS KMS, so that means you would, uh, if you choose to encrypt the data on HDFS, you would use the Hadoop 2.6 uh, encryption features that come along with it. Uh, you can also use uh, Lux or Linux encryption. You can also do if, uh, uh, any other kind of encryption that you prefer uh, on the disk that is sitting on HDFS. But essentially, Hadoop 2.6 and LUX are the two mechanisms that people tend to use. Uh, the difference between that and S3 is this is integrated with AWS KMS. Uh, till date, uh, the HDFS encryption is not integrated with AWS KMS. You would have to uh, build that yourself, which is probably not a big deal, but you have to build that yourself. Um, so uh, we've done several uh, optimizations on EMRFS to make it really fast with S3, uh, including being able to list operations, uh, 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 list files on S3 pretty quickly. Uh, also, if you know a little bit about S3, S3 is eventually consistent, right? That means uh, when you write to it, uh, and it's a, if it's a new object, and if you're in US East, the next read might or might not have the data. Right, so how does it work with event, uh, with eventual consistency? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. Uh, maybe we can pick that up at the end. Okay. Uh, so you want me to talk about that now, or? Okay. Um. So uh, let me talk. Let me let me go to the Nasdaq story. So uh, I think I have somewhere here the Nasdaq story. But let me talk about this story. So uh, what the story is that Nasdaq had 
um, uh, a, a, a bunch of data stores that were on premise. They decided to migrate over to the cloud. They use Redshift. But for ad hoc analysis of data, um, um, they, they prefer to run Hadoop clusters or Presto, actually. Uh, they tried a bunch of different systems, but they're running Presto on top of the, uh, data sitting in S3. But the basic requirement was being able to encrypt the data um, um, at rest, and that they did using client-side encryption using the HSM keys that are, uh, that are on premise. So I'll just show you a couple of slides in that. Presented at one, you had any kind of the um, one of the AWS summits. I think it was New York this year. So it was presented by Nate Summons, who is a principal architect at, uh, um, at uh, uh, NASDAQ. Uh, I won't even do a great job of it, so I'll let you read through some of this, but I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of commentary around this. Uh, the slides are also online. If you, if, you, if you search at SlideShare, it was presented at one of the summits. I've basically reproduced it here. But essentially, they replaced their on-premise data warehouse with Amazon Redshift in uh, 2014. If you don't know what Amazon Redshift is, it's uh, Amazon's petabyte scale, uh, massively parallel data warehouse on the, uh, on the cloud. Uh, it's essentially an MPP data warehouse. Uh, it's built out of the same team as us. Um, so their on-premise data, uh, their on-premise warehouse holds data for a year. But uh, the Redshift migration yielded them Roughly around, um, that's ridiculous numbers, 57% cost savings. And that's because Redshift on a reserved form costs you about $1,000 a terabyte a year, which is, uh, uh, which is extraordinary. Um, but obviously, this was 2014. Business now wants more data. Uh, they currently have Jan 2014 to present. So just about one year worth of data uh, in Redshift. But business wants a lot more data. They want to be able to process a lot more data, data at scale. So um, let me let me go this way so I can see the slide. So the problem was that while uh, Redshift holds their one year worth of data, they wanted a lot more uh, historical data that uh, be available to the analysts for them to be able to query it. Uh, they needed a solution uh, to store the historical data set. Uh, any guesses what that solution was? S3. Somebody said S3. You get pizza. <laughs> so, yeah, so uh, again, they, they, they looked at exactly the same thing. Uh, they, they looked at S3 uh, and being able to decouple your storage and compute so they can put massive amounts of data, uh, more than a year old of data, in S3. They can encrypt it. And they, uh, uh, it's distributed by default. That means uh, an availability zone or, or a data center or a group of data centers going down will not take, take away their data. And it comes at something lower than three and a half cents a gigabyte a month. Right? So they chose that. Plus, being able to run any kind of processing application on top of it, whether you're running Spark, Hive, Big, uh, or Presto on top of this data was a really big advantage for them. Um, also, when you do all of these things, there's nothing special that you require. If you're running MapReduce today on your on-premise machines or on the cloud, uh, running on S3, running your MapReduce jobs on S3 is exactly the same. You just replace the HDFS to say S3. That's all it is. So um, they wanted a SQL interface for all their archive data, uh, and they wanted the SQL interface to be available to all their uh, analysts. Um, this is their diagram, so uh, what basically, uh, if you know Presto, so Presto came out of uh, Facebook, but to be able to build uh, uh, schemas on Presto, you need Hive, so that's where, where their persistent schemas live in the Hive Metastore. Uh, they use Presto clusters with encrypted data, so they actually wrote an encryption materials provider and, and are going to contribute it back to Presto. So 
they have on-premise HSM, which allow them to encrypt data on S3. And then they have a SQL-like interface on Presto that allows any of their analysts to go and query all of their data that is sitting on S3 at any point of time. And if nobody's doing it, they just don't ever pay any compute costs on top of it. So uh, what, does it, what does it do for them? Uh, single source of truth, highly durable encrypted files in S3, uh, avoid read hard spots. This is the uh, key naming convention that I was talking to you about. All your keys end up looking exactly the same. You end up starting to have hot spots. Um, uh, S3 does give you very, very high read currency, so you shouldn't be worried about that uh, at all. Multiple compute clusters isolate workloads for users. So if I have a user that runs Hive versus a user that runs Presto versus a third user that runs a completely different technology, I should be able to run parallel clusters on them without they needing to share the same infrastructure or without you hearing complaints that that guy spoiled my cluster and my jobs can't run. Right? So a cost allocation using multiple AWS accounts. This is an interesting uh, way where they have different uh, buckets and based upon different buckets, they can actually allocate cost back to different queries. Um, and run multiple different query layers and experiment with new projects. So the same data set, today they're running Presto, but six months down the line, so they're experimenting with both Spark and Drill. Remember, all you need to do is you need to point to the same data set, and you could be running one cluster running Spark and the other cluster running Drill, and you can experiment with all your data set. Also, then you're not enforcing the same technology on your entire team. You're telling your team, here's a way to programmatically run, spin up a cluster. Here's your data in S3. You go and run whatever you want. So if you're a data scientist like Icepop uh, or uh, Python, they can run any kind of notebook on top of VMR. Somebody run, likes Hive and Drill, they can run that. Somebody likes Tez, Hive on Tez, they can run that. All on the same data set. Right? So you're not going and trying to gain consensus on I want this particular, uh, I only want everybody to run high. Right? So uh, I think that's really great, right? because it then gives all kinds of developers a way to process the same data set. Um, also, um, somebody asked you a question about Splunk. So they also have Splunk, basically, which does all, all the monitoring, uh, monitoring for them. This is Largely, their security data access uh, uh, data flow. I won't go into details, but they use Parquet. Uh, they use Parquet uh, just because of the way, um, um, currently, uh, because it's self-describing. But I think a lot, you will see it in the next slide. They use Parquet compared to ORC because of the encrypted performance that they saw with Presto and Parquet. Um, so uh, if you're not familiar with Parquet, Parquet is the columnar data format. It's self-describing. Uh, I think it came out of Cloudera. So uh, plus Parquet is supported by... No, it did not. It did not? No, Twitter? Cloudera had another attempt at a project that failed. That okay. Was, where, where did Parquet came out of? I don't remember who came up with it, but... I, I thought... Okay. It wasn't Twitter. It, it might have been Twitter. Twitter or Cloudera? One of Cloudera was working on one called Trevny. Trevny, yeah. Trevny failed. Really. Okay. So uh, I stand corrected, Parquet. Somebody built Parquet, and we should all thank them for it. Um, but uh, uh, supported by, so Parquet today has a lot of support. So Impala, Hive, Trolls, Spark, Presto, all of them support Parquet for format. But here you would see some data evaluated Parquet in ORC. Uh, what I don't, uh, what this is great, but what I don't, uh, don't know about this is what versions of Parquet and ORC were compared. So it's slightly unfair to ORC at this point, so I'll caveat that. Uh, that while this might be true, uh, but all these formats are, are rapidly changing and evolving in how they're doing things. But look at this, so ORC encrypted performance is, was currently a problem for them. Uh, eight, and this is all data, the Parquet data is actually sitting on S3. Um, so ORC was 15 x lower versus unencrypted. Um, eight CPUs on two nodes uh, used to get 900 megabytes per second versus 60 megabytes per second on encrypted data. Um, if I just look at this number on columnar format and with S3, um, I think that, uh, uh, that that shows me the performance with S3 is really, really good. Encrypted Parquet is 27% slower versus unencrypted. Parquet 100 megabytes per second from S3 per CPU core. This is what their uh, analysis showed, right? So you can start thinking about how big a cluster you need if you're processing all the data. Uh, there are some unique ways in which Parquet works. Uh, data fields are not supported yet. 
so that's why the, the version number would have been useful. Uh, but currently, the way you do dates is use them as ends. They use Presto. I talked to you about this. Uh, Presto is uh, the reason a lot of people like Presto is uh, it's got an NCI SQL interface. Um, uh, we also see people at Facebook, Netflix, Airbnb really like it. Um, uh, uh, also, it works. Uh, Are you trying to sell Presto to me? No. no, I'm not trying to sell Presto, Drill, Hive, Pig, Impala, or anything to you. No, you will buy. Sorry, drill heel by yeah, yeah. So I'm 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 away from that religious debate. I build a service that allows people to take the data processing framework that they have and and run it uh, cheaply, securely, and easily on AWS. That's the uh, you guys are the brains. You do you know how how to do distributed SQL on S3. So I'm not trying to sell you Presto. I'm just trying to tell you what Nasdaq has. Uh, but I also think. They said, yeah. So there, I was just wondering because you've said Presto about 45 times. I've heard you say Presto more than Amazon. It's real only three times. Okay. So my apologies for saying Presto 45 times. <laughs> 46. <laughs> All right. No more of the SQL distributed engine that uh, they use. That, that's all I had. Um, I had a couple of other examples as well, but we'll keep that for another day. Um, uh, I hope you got answers to uh, the questions that you're looking for. I'm, I'm available here, but if you have any questions, if you have any feedback, feel free to let me know. So everybody can give a round of applause.